Welcome to Wednesday Worship. We're Gillian and Paul Langford, members of the Methodist Church, and I'm a local preacher in the Falmouth and Gwanet Methodist Circuit. As we continue the I Am Sayings of Jesus this week, our subject is the Bread of Life. I've always loved food, so I warm to references in the Bible which have a link to food. I'm very partial to a freshly buttered Cornish split, or a bread roll to those who don't understand the word split. When Jesus met, fed more than 5,000 people, imagine that the boy had five of these and two pieces of fish. That was a substantial meal for one. Even at today's prices, it would have been a cheap meal. Now, not everyone can enjoy a buttered split or a piece of fish for various reasons. Some have allergies, some can't eat butter or bread, some don't like fish, some won't buy products that are wrapped in packaging that can't be recycled. So actually, we choose which food to buy according to our likes, dislikes and principles. Today, we're not asked to consider buttered splits but the statement of Jesus, I am the bread of life, or as the contemporary English version puts it, I am the bread that gives life. So what's the context of this statement? Food, of course. Jesus had earlier fed more than 5,000 people miraculously from the boy's meal and there were 12 baskets full left over. By any standards, that was a cheap meal. More importantly, it reflected the boy's generosity and a miracle of great proportions. We then read, Jesus realised that they would try to force him to be their king. So he went up on a mountain where he could be alone. But the crowd <clears throat> pursued him. They found him on the west side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that you are not looking for me because you saw the miracles, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that gives eternal life. The Son of Man will give you this food because God has given him the right to do so. What exactly does God want us to do? The people asked. Jesus answered, God wants you to have faith in the one he sent. They replied, What miracle will you work so that we can have faith in you? What will you do? For example, when our ancestors were in the desert, they were given manna to eat. It happened just as the scriptures say. God gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then told them, I tell you for certain that Moses wasn't the one who gave you bread from heaven. My father is the one who gives you the true bread from heaven. And the bread that God gives is the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. The people said, Lord, give us this bread and don't ever stop. Jesus replied, I am the bread that gives life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who has faith in me will ever be thirsty. Jesus told them not to work for food that spoils, but work for food that gives eternal life. So there was a different kind of food he was speaking about. 
Now imagine having been in the crowd that day when more than 5,000 people were fed. Would we have asked, What miracle will you work so that we can have faith in you? What will you do? How insulting! Shouldn't the miracle have provided sufficient evidence? The crowd recalled stories of ancestors eating manna in the desert, which God gave them at the time of Moses. Their minds were still on physical food. Jesus then told them, I tell you for certain that Moses wasn't the one who gave you bread from heaven. My father is the one who gives you the true bread from heaven. And the bread that God gives is the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. Jesus' personality was Holy Spirit inspired. The crowd's attitude changed immediately. Suddenly, they wanted more than buttered splits, as they said, Lord, give us this bread and don't ever stop. To which Jesus responded, I am the bread that gives life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. The very use of the words I am would have gained his hearers' attention. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, we read the story of Moses and the burning bush. That out of that bush, God called Moses to lead his persecuted people out of Egypt. Now, like so many of us today, when God calls, Moses resisted the call by trying to find some reason why he should not go to Egypt and face Pharaoh. At that time, the Egyptians had many gods known by many different names. Moses was perhaps leaning towards accepting the role when he said to God, I will tell the people of Israel that the God their ancestors worshipped <coughs> has sent me to them. But what should I say if they ask me your name? And God gave his answer. I am the eternal God. So tell them that the Lord, whose name is I Am, has sent you. This is my name forever, and it is the name that people must use from now on. The name Yahweh, or Jehovah, is derived from the Hebrew word for I Am. The term was used to revere God and express his nature and character. But Jesus didn't stop at I am, but extending the sentence said, I am the bread that gives life. Jesus was saying, we need more than physical bodily food, something extra, which only he can supply. Whilst some of us may not be able to eat a buttered split, no one who is genuinely seeking can find anything to dislike about the bread, the spiritual food that Jesus offers. This food is both life-giving and life-changing. It is free for all, but far from cheap. It cost Jesus his life through the torture of crucifixion, but he gave himself willingly to reconcile us to God. Our dear friend, the late Robbie Bowen, was such an <clears throat> example of the reality of this spiritual bread, the living presence of Jesus, as with such assurance that shone out of him, his whole aim was to glorify God as he lived for him and looked forward expectantly to being eternally with him in heaven. 
When we eat bread during a communion service, the bread is a substitute for Jesus' body, by which we remember his death, as he told us to. The wonder is that he offers us not simply a substitute for himself, but himself, his living presence, so that we can have a personal relationship with him, made possible by his birth, death and resurrection. Yes, we can personally know the bread of life, Jesus as Lord and Saviour, something I discovered when I was just 10 years old as I was propelled from my seat. But there is a condition. We might admire seeing a buttered split, but it is of no benefit until we've eaten it. Similarly, we can benefit from this bread of life only after inviting Christ Jesus into our lives, so that through our daily journey with him, we grow more like him and sustain our spiritual life. And if, like me, you asked him in more than 60 years ago, we can still invite him in every day. So are we following in Robert's footsteps? His greatest delight would be to know that we have the same assurance that he displayed, particularly during the final weeks of his earthly life. So may we each day discover more and more of what it means to taste this bread of life and feed on it as through prayer, Bible study and worship, we develop our faith in Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that your sacrifice on Calvary's tree was to reconcile the world's people to God. And for that, we are most grateful. Today, those of us who have invited you in, enjoy that personal relationship and discover your presence, your guidance, and have the assurance of eternal life with you in heaven. We praise you for the faith that exudes from the Bowen household and pray your special presence upon Ruth, Hannah, Dan, and other members of their family. Grant that we may all be diligent in following you and welcome you in afresh each day. If there are those sharing in this worship who do not know you, speak to them, we pray, and draw them into your wonderful presence. For Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today and God bless you.